Hello and welcome to Tete a Tete, France 24's flagship one-on-one -on -one interview show. A year ago in Iran, a 22-year-old woman died in police custody for not wearing properly the mandatory veil. Her name was Masa Amini, and her death sparked an unprecedented wave of protests fueling speculation that the regime in Tehran was on its last legs. However, after a brutal crackdown, the Islamic Republic is still there. Its president will soon travel to New York for the UN General Assembly, and the regime reached a deal to swap prisoners and access frozen funds with the Biden administration. Our guest was forced to leave Iran back in 1979 for a good reason. His father, the late Shah of Iran, had just been toppled. He has since become a staunch opposition member in exile of the regime. Reza Pahlavi, the eldest son of the late Shah of Iran, joins us from Washington, D.C. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. So a year after Masa Amini's death and the beginning of this unprecedented wave of protest, it appears the mullahs, as they're known, have won. Do you share that assessment? Actually, it's just the opposite. It's out of being afraid from the people that are so desperately trying to intimidate them, shoot them in the face, uh, execute them, torture them. This is not a sign of stability. This is a sign of weakness. And we see more and more cracks within the regime every day augmenting. We see signs from members of the militia and the military show their sympathy towards the people. And soon enough, I think the moment will come when they will also peel away from the regime and join the people. But right now, we are focused on the current movement and resistance that my brave compatriots are uh, uh, facing very clearly, you know, the four corners of Iran. So uh, the regime, uh, like many other totalitarian regimes that we have seen in history, may last a little bit while longer, but they are doomed to fail and to fall. And that's what we hope uh, sooner rather than later that uh, our compatriots will prevail in their struggle for liberty. Right. Uh, ahead of this one year anniversary, we've seen uh, arrests of uh, personalities, families of uh, Masa Amini and those killed in the ensuing uh, crackdown. Uh, what are you calling for on this uh, one year commemoration of her death? Well, obviously, uh, from a tactical standpoint, I know that many of my compatriots within Iran are trying to be as dispersed as possible for an obvious reason that the more they are dispersed and they carry out these manifestations across the country, the regime cannot be thinning all of its troops and have enough manpower to try to stop and or uh, quash uh, various uh, movements uh, within the country. Internationally speaking, from Australia to Europe to Canada, Iranians in many major cities are going to gather on this day uh, in commemoration of Mahsa's uh, murder. But let's understand one thing. This is simply a day to remember, but the following day and the days following that, uh, we are entering a new phase of our campaign of resistance and civil disobedience. What's important, however, is that this momentum cannot be uh, not supported by countries that have always claimed to be supporters of freedom and human rights. And we need them today to stay in solidarity with the Iranian people. Enough is enough after 43 years. We hope that the free world, the democratic nations of this world, will actually, beyond just uh, verbal support, uh, take the necessary measures to assist us with maximum support as possible, uh, so that the Iranian people can, in fact, this time, uh, have uh, the understanding that they are not alone in this fight and the world does care and will support them. Right. Uh, speaking of Western country, let's speak of the country uh, where you're speaking from, the United States. As I said, uh, the U.S. and Iran have clinched a deal whereby five U.S. citizens held in Iran are going to be swapped against five Iranians uh, held in the U.S. And in addition, uh, Iran will be granted access to $6 billion of Iranian assets held in South Korea for humanitarian use. Uh, as we mark this one-year commemoration, what is your reaction to this deal uh, between the U.S. and Iran? Well, we saw what happened the first time Iran under the Obama administration. And one of our major concerns at the time with the uh, initial JCPOA was the money released how is it going to be controlled? How do we know what is going to be spent on? And once the money is in the hand of the regime, it's certainly not going to benefit the Iranian people or their economic situation. It's going to continue fueling their uh, uh, avant-garde in uh, Lebanon or Syria. And basically, anything that is to preserve the system 
that, by the way, continues repression at home. And uh, at the end of the day, uh, I don't think that it had any impact at the time uh, other than, uh, once again, throwing some kind of a lifeline uh, to the regime. This time around, it's even worse because this time you have, in fact, validated the regime's uh, attempt of using hostages as a bargaining chip at a much higher cost than the first time around. So basically, you have legitimized that it does pay to take hostages. And as such, who is to say that they won't do the same thing tomorrow? And if you, in fact, decided to, despite that, go ahead and strike such a deal, then why only a few hostages were released? Why not the rest of them? And ultimately, how do you know and how do you claim that you actually have control that this released money is going to be supposedly spent on humanitarian uh, results? If the intent was to help uh, humanitarianly, why give it to the regime? Why, why not giving it directly to the people through uh, uh, NGOs and other entities? This regime is not to be trusted. And this time around, I don't see any different except that this is sending the totally wrong message to a nation that is struggling and fighting for its uh, liberty, and it's a slap in their face. And as I said in my tweet a few hours ago, the Iranian people will not forget at the time of uh, struggle who stood with them and who, in fact, did not help them at all. Do you feel that the Biden administration is betraying the Iranian people by striking such a deal? And also, as we hear, maybe negotiate a new nuclear deal? Well, this administration is doing whatever it is, but I'm happy to say that at least on the legislative side of this country, Congressman today approved uh, uh, and, and signed uh, uh, in majority a support for the Mahsa Act here in the United States. And I'm thankful at least to the Congressman for having done that, and I hope that it will pass the Senate as well. These are indicative that legislators in this country are standing on the right side of the equation, are taking steps, and we should not be prisoners of just one White House and its mission, because life goes on, administration change. Ultimately, it's the general public here in the United States, in Europe and elsewhere, who should pressure their governments that the Iranians expect multipartisan or bipartisan support for their cause of liberty and freedom. And if America claims to be the, the land of the free and with the Statue of Liberty and have always claimed to be the flagship for freedom and democracy around the world, well, this is time to actually prove it in deeds rather than just words. Do you think a negotiation is going on on uh, nuclear issues as we speak? Well, obviously, uh, this administration again attempted to resurrect uh, the JCPOA and uh, basically 2.0. But again, the level of enrichment at this point where it has reached, I wonder whether or not the Iranian regime actually needs to any more worry about having some kind of a deal. It's too late for that. The problem, again, uh, is not by trying to strike a deal with a regime that cannot be trusted whatsoever. The problem is the finger on the trigger. It's the nature of the beast. And if you eliminate the beast, every problem, including the nuclear threat, would, uh, would uh, be eliminated. It simply is not under, uh, understandable why is this that there's an insistence to maintain a status quo when time and again you have witnessed the fact that this regime cannot be trusted. Instead, right. put your faith and invest on the Iranian people. They are the alternative, not this regime. In February, you took the stage at Georgetown University with activists such as Masi Alinejad, Nazanin Bonyadi, Hamid Ismailian, promising a united opposition front. It was called the Alliance for Democracy and Freedom in, in Iran. I'm using the past tense uh, because it lasted only a few weeks. Some of the members pointed fingers at you for uh, this uh, failure. Uh, why this failure? And are you the one responsible for that? Well, first of all, I think if I'm guilty of transparency and asking for more uh, uh, participation, that's what I had uh, uh, mentioned in our uh, internal discussions. And uh, unfortunately, we were unable to, uh, based on that existing crew, to have an expansion and a more balanced uh, platform. And I did warn them that if that is going to happen, then we will have parallel tracks and others taking um, uh, other uh, initiatives. But the, I, I would like to point you much more to what's happening inside Iran today, within the Iranian uh, uh, public, uh, as well as university. Uh, centers, the intelligentsia at home, even a uh, political organization uh, that may not be visible but are uh, operating on the ground. There's definitely uh, a call for unity and cooperation at home. It's beginning to also proceed outside. 
And like anything else, you will have to find the more appropriate players uh, to perform a particular uh, uh, role. And in, I, the call for unity remains the same. The principles of the charter remain the same. Uh, I mentioned that in one interview to an Iranian outlet saying that, look, you may have a, a, a piece of theater and the, the script remains the same. The actors may change, but the script and the story remains the same. So ultimately, we'll see which actors uh, are, are, are more, more capable of uh, uh, providing this uh, avenue. And as long as they're willing to uh, expand and, and be inclusive rather than exclusive, that's the way we should look at it. Right. Uh, and I insisted on inclusivity rather than exclusivity. Right. Uh, just as a last question, what is uh, your goal, uh, the restoration of uh, the regime of your father? Do you consider yourself as a crown prince in waiting, or uh, is it a totally different regime change that you're advocating for your country? Everyone who knows me and have read my books and have listened to me in various speeches and interviews know very well that the only mission that I see for myself is to be able to help my compatriots go through a phase of transition to ultimately be able to cast their vote in a national referendum. I believe that after the regime collapses, we will face a period of transition where obviously an interim government will have to manage the country's affairs, but at the same time prepare the grounds for the elections of people representatives at the Constituent Assembly to, in fact, debate in such assembly all the aspects of what kind of a system and constitution we would like to have for the future. And ultimately, the result of that process will lead to a democratic uh, outcome where the Iranian people will cast their votes and decide in their majority what they want. That has always been my sole goal, and I've always said that that day will be mission accomplished as far as I'm concerned. I'm not gunning for any position or anything uh, else. I just want to be able to help this process. And I believe I have the trust of many of my compatriots after 44 years and counting that understand that this is only my vision and nothing beyond that. Reza Pallavi, I want to thank you very much uh, for appearing here uh, on France 24. And thank you for uh, watching Tete a Tete, France 24's flagship interview program.